Need some new Modern Horizons cards? Well, you can pre-order them from our sponsor, Card Kingdom, by heading over to CardKingdom.com. Hello, everyone. It's Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and it's time for our penultimate daily dose of Modern Horizons 2 spoilers. That's right, tomorrow we get the full set released. It is almost here, but today we got some interesting stuff to talk about, so we should probably jump right into it. Start talking sweet new Modern Horizons 2 cards. And first up today, we get the last member of the free evoke elemental cycle, the red member of the cycle, Fury. So Fury, 5 mana, 3-3 three, three double strike. Of course, you can evoke it by exiling a red card from your hand, and when it enters the battlefield, it deals 4 damage, divided as you choose, among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers. So Fury actually pretty directly calls back to an old card in Pyrokinesis. Pyrokinesis, you might I know this, but Force of Will is actually part of a cycle. Force of Will is the all-star from the cycle. Pyrokinesis is probably the second best member of the cycle, and it actually does still see a bit of play all the way back to Legacy, uh, but Pyrokinesis is exactly Fury, except it's instant speed and can't hit Planeswalkers because they didn't exist back in Alliance's time. Fury, sorcery speed for some reason, which is kind of weird since some of the other elementals are instant speed, but you can't potentially get a decent body out of it. I mean, I I was looking at double strike creatures in modern that have at least three power and really Snapdax is the only one that's cheaper than fury so you're getting the upside of maybe playing a wrecking ogre which isn't a thrilling body in the modern format but it's something at least three three double strike for five isn't absolutely pitiful especially with a good etb trigger attached so the most interesting part about fury is it compares pretty well to a card that still sees play in legacy like pyrokinesis shows up in legacy goblins primarily and one of the cool things about Fury is it's the only member of this cycle that can actually generate card advantage. When you think about what this cycle does, we've talked about how all the other members, if you're evoking them, it's putting you down a card. You're spending two cards to counter a spell or kill a creature. So it's card disadvantage. Fury, in its best case scenario, can actually kill way more things than cards you're spending. You spend two cards to Fury, but you kill, let's say, Elvish Mystic Llanowar, Heritage Druid, Elvish visionary you're killing four of your opponent's cards with two of your cards that is absolutely insane so the best case scenario for fury is very high its ceiling is like win the game almost essentially a wrath attached to a body that you could potentially cast for free even just getting a couple of creatures which seems pretty practical is very powerful like you kill a leon and arbor nathalia against a taxes deck or snake allures in the stoneforge mystic or a young pyromancer red horde arcanist that's still fine you're trading two cards for two of your opponent's cards, plus you're trading your bad cards for their good cards, so Fury is a really powerful effect, and it does have the additional upside that it can hit Planeswalkers, which is something Pyrokinesis can't do. Uh, whether or not it's going to be able to kill a Planeswalker really depends on the scenario. If your opponent, like, plays a Teferi and takes it down, Fury's going to snipe it for sure. On the other hand, if they take it up or Jace takes it up, it's a little bit hit or miss. On the other hand, it does have the drawback of being sorcery speed, and and there's a big question as to how much that matters. I feel like ah, legacy decks probably are not going to drop Pyrokinesis for Fury. I think that it is a big enough deal that you're probably not going to do that because remember one of the things we talked about one of the upsides of this cycle is it saves you when everything goes wrong uh, with cards like Endurance your opponent goes to reanimate something to win the game Endurance is going to save you for zero mana or your opponent goes to combo off with Heliad Walking Bliss to Solitude Subtlety they're going to save you Fury does not have that aspect it's a main phase during your turn sorcery speed effect which I think would have me rank it as the least powerful of the cycle, in all honesty. Not that it's bad, and I do think it has a role, and it will probably play played in sideboards, because some of those best-case scenarios we were talking about, where you're picking off two or three creatures, is really, really powerful, but being sorcery speed is a really really big drawback grief kind of gets around this because of its shenanigans where it can just win the game if you have ephemerate on like turn one or turn two uh, it gets around that a little bit the rest of the cycle all is flash that leaves fury is kind of the odd elemental out i would say it doesn't have flash to save you from combos it doesn't have a oops i thought sees you three times by turn two and win the game mode like grief does so i think i would rank this as the least powerful of the bunch but i still think 
like it can see playing sideboards. Uh, he is very good in some matchups. When you're killing multiple creatures for free, it's going to feel really strong. And, I mean, the body is not bad. Double Strike does make it the fastest clock of the bunch if you can get through with it, and the ability does help you get through with it. So, Fury, I'm not saying it's a bad card, but I do think it is the least exciting of the free spell of Oak Cycle. We also got... Ooh, Soul Talisman. So, Soul Talisman, no mana, artifact. Suspend for three turns for one mana. Taps to add two mana. This is Soul Ring, or should we say Slow Ring? Uh, essentially, it's a Soul Ring that you have to suspend for three turns. The question is, is a Soul Ring that you have to suspend for three turns actually good in any format? And the thing I like about this card is it kind of completes this weird, like, semi-cycle of suspend cards that call back to busted alpha cards. We now have Soul Talisman to go with Soul Ring. We have Lotus Bloom as Black Lotus. We have Mox Tantalite, which kind of fills in for the whole Mox cycle. So if you your busted artifact from Alpha, you now have a modern legal version with Suspend, which is really cool. So I like that they printed this card. On the other hand, I'm not actually sure this card is good. If you look at the similar cards that are legal and modern, Mox Tantalite doesn't see play, period. Lotus Bloom sees play in very specific decks. Decks where if I get to X mana, I win the game, like Enduring Ideal, Ad Nauseum. In those decks, I think you're still just going to play Lotus Bloom over Soul Talisman for two reasons. One is Lotus Bloom adds colored mana, which is pretty relevant in like an Ad Nauseum deck, which has some weird color, like need white mana, plus I need blue mana, plus I need double black mana. So Lotus Bloom making colored mana does matter. The other thing is, the decks that play Lotus Bloom don't care about repeatable mana. Like, having a soul ring that taps for two mana each turn doesn't really matter if you're planning on winning the game the turn your Lotus Bloom or your suspend spell comes off suspend. So I don't think that Soul Talisman actually has very many implications. I guess you could try to, like, ask for Tolda into play or Shardless Agent or Electro Dominance. There are ways to sneak into play, but you're still just getting two mana. The free spells that see play in general, especially in like As for Soul, Cascade, Electrodominant style decks, are ones that win the game. These are the living ends, the restore balances, the crashing footfalls. I can't imagine that you're going to warp your deck to get a Soul Talisman that adds two extra mana. So my guess is Soul Talisman is essentially unplayable in modern. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's something I'm missing, but I would guess it is unplayable in modern. Maybe a better question is... How good is this in Commander? In Commander, Soul Ring is the format. What Brainstorm is in Legacy, Soul Ring is to Commander. It is a busted card that shows up in every deck. It'll never get banned because it's synonymous with the format. Soul Talisman, it does do the same thing with Suspend, but when you think about how this plays, Soul Ring is almost never horrible. Like, you can always use extra mana. Well, not always, but usually you can do something with extra mana in your commander deck. Soul Talisman, while it's fine if you suspend it, like, on turn one, and it comes into play on turn four, then you're getting some extra mana, that's nice. It is pretty painful off the top in the late game. If you want to see a comparison for Soul Talisman, it might actually be like a bad explosive vegetation or a bad worn power stone rather than an actual soul ring. I mean, if you think about worn power stone, you play it on turn three. On turn four, you're going to have two extra mana. That is essentially what you're getting with soul talisman, except I guess the upside is you're skipping your first turn to suspend it rather than your third turn for ward power stone. Also kind of compares to like an explosive vegetation effect. The problem with soul talisman is it's much, much worse than Explosive Vegetation or Soul Ring or even Worn Power Stone when it comes off the top of your deck in the mid game because you can't just play it. You gotta suspend it. And if you're drawing this on turn six, you're gonna wait till what, turn nine to actually get it? That's not very exciting. That's just too slow to really be useful. So I actually don't think that Soul Talisman, even though it references the best card in all of Commander, is gonna be a Commander staple. Instead, I lean towards this being a card for specific synergistic decks. Like, Ozgear can definitely take advantage of this card. You're gonna have ways to discard your cards. You get this in your graveyard. You get some copies of it. That's insane. It's another zero mana thing that you can copy and make a ton of mana. Or like, Cascade style decks. Yidris, First Sliver. You're just naturally gonna end up cascading into this eventually, and then you have extra mana, which doesn't hurt. Or maybe something very narrow, like Vega the Watcher, which specifically cares about casting spells from anywhere but your hand. Suspend is casting 
Amnesty a spell from Exile, so it's going to trigger your commander. So that's my guess. I don't think this whole Talisman is a new commander staple. I actually don't even think it's that good in most commander decks, but if you're playing a specific deck that can take advantage of the zero mana aspect, or pff, Vega taking advantage of casting spells any place but your hand, I think it's good. So Soul Talisman is a card that I like that it exists. I like that it finishes this weird pseudo cycle of alpha artifacts is suspend cards. I like the references. I like the callback. But I don't think it's actually very good. I don't expect you to see any play in modern, uh, unless some weird like combo or synergy develops that we don't have right now. And in commander, I think it's more of a card for specific decks rather than a new staple. So cool card. Just not sure it's a very good one. We also got our blue no mana cost sorcery, inevitable betrayal. So no mana cost, suspend three for one in double blue. When it resolves, search target opponent's library for a creature, put it on the battlefield under your control. That player shuffles. So inevitable betrayal, it's bribery. It's literally suspend bribery. And bribery is a really powerful effect, but it's also pretty matchup dependent. Like how good bribery is, is exclusively based on how good your opponent's creatures are. Some matchups, it's absurd. Other matchups, not so absurd, which means I don't think you can play this as a main deck card in modern. On the other hand, I do like this card a lot as a potential sideboard piece for as for total Electro Dominance decks. Maybe Shardless Agent Cascades style decks where you can bring this in in the matchups where it's good because the ceiling is essentially I win the game like if you can play your as foretold cast this snag an Emrakul or an Ulamog you pretty much just win the game on turn three on the other hand you can't really main deck it because there's some matchups where you're gonna get a snapcaster mage or something like a monastery swift sphere which is just totally not worth a slot in your deck so in modern sideboard all-star for decks that can cast free spells the other place where inevitable betrayal will probably shine is in commander where bribery is pretty legit in commander most decks have some big threats in commander so it's hard for it to ever be truly bad like even if you're getting a seven drop with your five mana bribery you're trading up plus you're stealing one of your opponent's best cards so they're not going to draw it later but i feel like the suspend aspect is a problem this is a card that when you suspend it, people are going to attack you. No one wants to get hit by bribery. You can try to politicize your way through it. You can try to politic your way through it and be like, no, 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 I'm not going to target you. I'm going to target this person. But still, I feel like suspending this is going to put a target on your head, which might limit it to cascade decks like Yidris or Golos decks, decks that let you cast it for free right away. So Inevitable Betrayal, it's a sweet card. It's a powerful card, but it's just a matchup dependent card. In modern, side board card i think for as foretold in commander just be warned that you're going to get beaten down but if you can cascade into it or have other shenanigans with your commander to cast it without suspending it it can be very very good next up we have a new magus magus of the bridge so three mana triple black you get a four for human wizard whenever a non-token creature is put into your graveyard from the battlefield created two two black zombie creature token and when a creature is put into an opponent's graveyard from the battlefield you have to exile magus of the bridge so magus of the bridge it calls back to bridge from below it's the magus of bridge from below however it is missing the most important piece of text on bridge from below which is if bridge from below is in your graveyard all this stuff happens magus of the bridge it's not really magus of the bridge because it's got to be on the battlefield to do things so bridge from below got banned in the aftermath of the initial modern horizons where it was broken in the hogak deck although actually it really wasn't because hogak was even more broken after bridge from below was banned so it didn't actually do anything died for the sins of altar of dimension in Hogak. At the same time, Magus of the Bridge, I honestly really truly hate this card. I have spoken many, many times throughout spoiler season about how I love the designs of many of the cards from Modern Horizons 2. It is one of the coolest design sets with so many unique designs in the entire history of Magic, but I think that Magus of the Bridge is a huge, huge whiff. Magus of the Bridge is actually Magus of the Open Graves. Like, it, that's the card it actually is. Open the Graves, five-man enchantment, bad enough that it didn't even see playing standard when a non-token creature dies, 
guys, make it two do zombie, make us the bridges open the graves, except it's two mana cheaper, and if your opponent has a creature die, you have to lose your Magus of the Bridge. There's a million cards that do this. Blight Mound makes a pest when a creature dies. Rattling Reanimator's Anthon Necromancer makes zombies when a specific creature type dies. Pawn of Ulamog makes Eldrazi spawns. Abs and Ascendancy makes spirits. Feel the Souls makes spirits. Magus of the Bridge doesn't play at all like Bridge from Below. Not even a little bit. What made Bridge from Below Bridge from Below is you get it in the graveyard and it does all this crazy stuff for free. Magus of the Bridge doesn't do that. It doesn't even play a tiny bit like Bridge from Below. It plays like all these other cards that we have a million of and are usually not very good. So I think that Magus of the Bridge might be the biggest miss in all of Modern Horizons 2. It's not a bad card. Like if they wanted to print this card, that's fine. But I don't think you can call it Magus of the Bridge without having it work from the graveyard. Like that is the whole deal with Magus of the Bridge. So this is, I believe, the first Magus that doesn't even play a tiny bit like the card it's referencing. So Magus of the Bridge, I don't know. It's fine in some sort of aristocrat style deck, like a million other cards that we've already talked about that don't really see competitive play. But it is certainly not a bridge from below because it doesn't actually work from the graveyard and that's a whole deal for bridge below so as much as i like this set and as much as i love most of the designs from this set i really hate this card worst design from the entire set in my opinion we also got a new delve mythic dragon murktide region so five in double blue seven mana all together but it's a delve card it's never actually going to be seven mana you get a three three with flying except it enters the battlefield with a plus one plus one counter for each instant in sorcery that it exiles so in theory if you can exile five instant or sorceries to its delve cost you're going to end up with a 2 mana 8 8, which is kind of absurd. And then when an Answer Sorcery leaves your graveyard, you put a counter on it so it can grow throughout the game. So Murktide Regent calls back to a couple of cards. It's similar to Gurmag Angler, except it's flying. Also, kind of like Tomb Stalker, which is what gives me a little bit of a catch with Murktide Regent. Tomb Stalker has fallen out of favor. There was a time like a decade ago, people were Tomb Stalking, but now I haven't seen Tomb Stalker in forever, although Murktide Murktide Regent is way better than Tomb Stalker. It's one less mana. It has more upside where it can be bigger than a 5-5. It can grow throughout the game. So Murktide Regent, I think this card has a chance. In decks that play Gurmag Angler, these are like Delver shells in Legacy. These are Death Shadow shells in Modern on occasion. Is Murktide Regent better than Gurmag Angler? I think it really depends. It has much higher upside. I mean, you really only have to exile two instants or sorceries, and you're getting a Grim Angler that has flying and can grow later in the game. So it doesn't seem that hard to make it better than a Grim Angler, although Grim Angler does have the upside of only needing one mana. You can delve away six cards and pay one. Murktide Regent, you're always going to need at least two real mana. So that is a bit of a drawback. Uh, I could see Murktide Regent also maybe showing up in some sort of blitz shell that probably sounds weird but blitz decks have so many free spells that they can easily fill their graveyard and turn this on and have it be massive i guess the question is do you want to play an inconsistent card where if your graveyard gets shut down this is going to kind of do nothing and get stuck in your hand it might just be too inconsistent i do think that murktide regent is going to bring back thought scour thought scour is like the easiest way to combo with this card thought scour puts three cards in your graveyard for one mana it instant speed and it itself is an instant so it's going to help grow your Burktide region but something as simple as turn one fetch land turn two thought scour target yourself turn two fetch land is going to give you five cards for Murktide regent at least one of them will be an instant and sorcery and if you get a little lucky with your thought scour milling two of them could be an instant or sorcery so it doesn't seem that hard for this to come down as like a turn two four four five five maybe six six which seems very powerful so i think that Murktide regent definitely has a shot to be good also as i mentioned before it gets bigger throughout 
throughout the game, like you Snapcast or something, you get a counter on it, you cast another Murktide Regent or a Gurmag Angler, later you're going to get all those counters on Murktide Regent as well, so it can end up absolutely massive. So never underestimate Delve. That is the rule that we have learned. Delve is always really, really strong. I think there actually is a question whether or not this will see more play than Gurmag Angler. It's definitely better than Tombstalker, no question there. Will having two real mana attached to it be a deal breaker? Does it even matter? Or is the upside that this can be absolutely massive in the air early in the game and even bigger later enough to make it work? My guess is we will see Murktide Regent in Modern, in Legacy. If it's broken or just another good delve threat remains to be seen, but this is certainly a constructed playable card in the right shell. We've seen it time and time again with delve. We also got a bunch of lore rarity stuff, which not going to talk about everything individually. There are a few interesting cards. So Blossoming Calm, one mana instant, you gain Hexproof until your next turn, and you gain two life, and it has Rebound. Seems like it could be a good sideboard card against combo decks. Kind of like a, a watered down to Fairy's protection, where your opponent grape shots you, and you're like, nope, Blossoming Calm, gain two life, you can't target me, or you're dying to burn, and your opponent Lightning Bolt you, and you Blossoming Calm, and fizzle the bolt and gain some life and then two more with the rebound or scape shift into Valica. So I think this is something that's fairly narrow but in the right meta where combo is at the top, Blossoming Calm seems like a legit sideboard option. We also got hard evidence which is a pretty interesting card. One mana sorcery, you make a 0-3 blue crab creature token and you investigate to make a clue. This doesn't look like the type of card that would be constructed playable but it might be in a very narrow specific deck, which is Indomitable Creativity decks. Indomitable Creativity wants to blow up artifacts or creatures to kind of mass polymorph into multiple things. The thing is, to make an Indomitable Creativity deck work, you can't play actual creatures other than the finishers that you're trying to hit, or actual artifacts other than your finishers you're trying to Indomitable Creativity into. Hard Evidence as a sorcery fits naturally in the deck, and because Indomitable Creativity can hit artifacts or creatures, creatures actually makes two sackable things with one card, which seems pretty powerful, plus a 0-3 pretty good against uh, aggro decks as a blocker, which is one of the places where Indomitable Creativity Polymorph style deck struggles, so while your average deck is not going to be making 0-3 Clarabs, Indomitable Creativity might be interested in hard evidence. We also got Blacksmith's Skill, which is kind of like a artifacty reverse Karametra's Blessing. For one man, you have a permanent hexproof and indestructible, so it's not dying, essentially. If it's an artifact, you also give it plus two, plus two. This might be one of the new best protection spells for something like Feather. The combination of hexproof and indestructible means rats don't get rid of it, it means that exile base removal can't target it. Basically, your thing is not going to die. If you blacksmith skill it, nothing really gets rid of it outside of, I guess, an edict if you have no other creatures. But really, this is the strongest form of protection. So if you're playing something like Feather, this is probably just better than God's Willing or whatever other protection spell you're using. We also got... Ornithopter of Paradise, which, as its name suggests, is a Ornithopter Birds of Paradise. At two mana, I don't think it actually is going to see constructed play, but eh, maybe in some budgety commander style decks. It is a common, which is nice. We also got Echoing Return. One mana sorcery, return target creature card, and all other cards with the same name as that card from your graveyard to your hand. I don't think I would play this in a random deck, but I do really like its synergy with the cards that allow you to play any number in your deck. Shadowborn Apostle, Rat Colony, Relentless Rest, Persistent Petitioners, it seems like the perfect defense. Like, one of the problems with these decks is you run out a bunch of Rat Colonies or Relentless Rats. Your opponent rats your board, and then you're kind of out of luck because you're just drawing one more Relentless Rat each turn. Echoing Return in a deck with a whole bunch of the same card is insane. It could be returning 5, 10, 20, 40 copies of the card to your hand, which offers some combo potential. So I don't think you'd play this outside of a deck can have any number of these cards, decks, dot deck, if that makes sense. But in those decks, I think Echoing Returns to do All-Star, especially synergistic with Persistent Petitioners, because you can mill yourself with Persistent Petitioners to get more copies in the graveyard, then you can Echoing Return them all back, mill your opponent out really quickly. So a very cool design, powering up a very janky archetype. Finally today, in the world 
world of reprints, we got one somewhat interesting card, Hunting Pack. So seven mana instant, make a 4-4 beast token, Storm, too expensive to see constructed play, I think, but this could be a blowout in limited because Storm triggers on anyone's spells. If your opponent casts something main phase and then you cast this, you're going to get two beasts at instant speed, probably eat some attackers, so not a card I expect to see modern play, but a card that's probably going to be very strong in certain limited decks. Last but not least, in the world of collector's boosters, we get three more MH1 reprints, Sword of City and Steel. I love Old Border Swords. I hope they're all in Old Border eventually, even though I don't think Sword of City and Steel is one of the better ones. It does look so amazing. Prismatic Vista, staple of modern and commander, looking sharp. And Goblin Engineer, kind of weird. It's already in the Old Border, thanks to Time Spout Remastered, but more copies, never a bad thing of a cool reprint. So, Anyway, that brings us to the end of our second to last day of daily Modern Horizons 2 spoilers. So let me know what you think. Is Suspend Soul Ring good? What about the Red Elemental Fury? Is that better than I'm giving it credit for? All the other stuff, let me know what you think in the comments. I'll be back tomorrow to talk about whatever else we get, the full set, last day is spoilers, and then, don't worry, even though we're getting near the end, oh my goodness, it's really just the start, we're gonna have top 10 videos, we'll have a ton of gameplay and streams, so much stuff we're gonna do with this set, I cannot wait for spoilers to wrap up and the brewing to begin, so keep an eye out for all that too over the coming weeks, so until tomorrow everyone, have an amazing day, thanks for watching, and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, help us out by clicking that like button down below. And to keep up on all the latest and greatest, click that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that bell icon to get alerts whenever we have new videos. And if you want to, check out some of our other sweet videos here and here.